Hi there, this is Chris Jag. I'm reading a little excerpt from my book, Talking to Myself. This is chapter eight. Excuse me while I kiss the blonde. Jay, I made clothes with him, by the way. Jay and I made a memorable journey to Sweden in 1967, when Jimi Hendrix was touring out there. The idea was to cover our expenses by buying Swedish army coats and bringing them back to sell during the cold winter in London. We drove out there in my Mini on the ferry to Gothenburg and took a little hash with us, but as we approached the customs post, I panicked and swallowed the lump I'd stashed in my mouth. So the drive to Stockholm was quite interesting, with a road like a roller coaster of black velvet in the quiet dark night, and me feeling very queasy. But at least they still drove on the left back then. Jimmy's band were both surprised and pleased to see us. We saw them perform three times in one day, some kind of record in itself, I think. The first gig was held at a fairground in the afternoon, playing in front of the Big Dipper. Next was an evening club date, then on to a late night joint where Jimmy played again until around 4 a.m., drums and bass too as well, I think. And the line of blondes outside his dressing room was impressive too. He may have had a short life, but certainly it was a full one. It's funny to think that 40 years later I was a guest in Rocklau, Poland, for the Thanks Jimmy Festival. The Guinness World Record is attempted there each year for the most people in one place playing Hey Joe live on the guitars at the same time. Jimmy didn't write the song, it's attributed to Billy Roberts, but it sounds like he actually lifted the tune from another artist called Neela Miller. I played a tune of mine in Poland, On the Road, to the large crowd in the, in the square, solo, and then a version of Jimmy's Little Wing with a house band. I thought to myself I was probably the only person there who actually saw Jimmy play. Then I remembered Eric Burden was appearing too. He was a good mate of Jeff Jimmy's back in the day. Particularly as the animals bass player Chaz Chandler produced the early records. During Eric Burden's number, I toured the crowd with my camera and took hundreds of shots of all the guitar players who posed for me laughing and having fun. It was all quick fire shots and I used them years later, pasted in the booklet of a record. Everybody's making love or else expecting rain, our Zimmerman. My life in London in the 1960s was becoming increasingly irrelevant. What exactly was I going to do with myself? It will be the classic case of the super successful elder brother and the younger dissolute one if I wasn't careful. Youth may have its excuses, but after the flush leaves the cheeks, people are less likely to indulge you or give you their time. I came to meet some influential figures, which was great, but of course, after the initial introductions, you are on your own. There were many peripheral dudes on the scene then, often with money, who liked to hang around bands and be associated with the glamorous lifestyle. Some were upper-class dilettantes, who took up photography to meet pretty girls. Some drove fast cars and dished out drugs, becoming the victims of their own excesses. I didn't want to go down that road. John Lennon usually had a quick comment for any situation and might make a joke at your expense, and the Liverpool humour is very sarcastic. The Beatles always referred to my brother as your kid, as in, how's your kid then? which took a little getting used to. I spent one late night in John's company in a Chelsea pad, along with John Dunbar, Marianne Faithfull's husband, who ran the Indica Gallery in London. Lennon was intrigued with Bob Dylan's Ballad of a Thin Man, and the eerie and rather long tune was spun many times on the record player till we were sick of it. Paul McCartney would often refer to Mick as the Prince of Pop, and the relationship between the two bands was one of both rivalry and friendship. Paul lived not too far away from my brother in a large detached house in St John's Wood, a smart area of North London. One day I knocked on his door and was asked in and shown round. 
He had an artist in residence there, colouring the wallpaper in swirling patterns. Paul was also a buddy of Klaus Foreman, who had drawn the revolver cover, and being close to art dealer Robert Fraser, began a good art collection, which presumably he still has. Paul asked if I wanted some grub, so he sat in his dining room, while his elderly housekeeper lady served us two veg, meat and gravy on nicely warmed plates. It was rather like a superior school dinner. All this before Linda came along with the veggies. Ringo Starr was the down-to-earth one. Mick took me to a Christmas party there one time in Ringo's large house in Stanmore, some miles out from North London, and he was a good host, but there wasn't much entertainment. Eric Clapton was there and wanted to have a jam, so he asked if there was a guitar around he could play. Ringo pointed to an old Spanish acoustic languishing in the corner, which wasn't quite what Eric had in mind. That was the first time I met Ringo's wife, Maureen, who later became a friend when she was with the Hard Rock Cafe's founder, Isaac Tigret. One band that regularly visited Harley House where Mick lived was the Small Faces, always chirpy and ready for action. I went to the Stack show at the Hammersmith Odeon in London with Stevie Marriott, Ronnie Lane and Ian McLaggen, where some fans asked us for our autographs. I told them I wasn't in the band. At the time, I was sometimes embarrassingly mistaken for Peter Noon, who fronted Herman and the Hermits and was a huge star. The girls didn't buy it, and one replied smartly, Come on, we know you're one of the small faces. The stack show was the best I've ever seen, period. The curtains drew back to reveal Booker T and the MGs. Donald Duck Dunn and Steve Cropper with Al Jackson on the drums laying down Green Onions, the sole anthem of Generation. After one more warm-up tune, the all-star cast was then introduced. First the pretender to the throne, Arthur Conley, with sweet soul music aided by the Bar K's horn section. Then Eddie Floyd with Knock on Wood, the wicked picket in the midnight hour. And Sam and Dave, hold on, I'm coming. Next came Rufus and Carla Thomas and the headline of the fantastic Otis Reddy with Mr. Pitiful and all those wonderful songs he sang before his untimely death in that plane crash. The small faces were also close friends with P.P. P. Arnold, Pat. Previously one of Ike Turner's Ikeettes, she had jumped ship from the iron grip of Ike Turner who ran his troop like Diaghilev did the Ballet Russe. I'd seen them when they toured theatres and cinemas across the UK with their sole review. The pounding rhythm section, Ike's spiky guitar, the kicking horns, the shimmering Ikeettes with their sparkly dresses and straight brown wigs, and of course the star of the show, Tina herself. Although she was having a torrid time with Ike, which we didn't know, it was a hot show that I'd witnessed close up from the wings, and I liked their act then, with all the, rather than all the power ballads that brought Tina so much success. Pat Arnold saw there was a chance for her to grab something for herself, and with the support of Andrew Oldham and Mick, she disappeared into hiding at the end of the tour. Despite Ike's efforts to locate her, he had to leave Britain without her. A blow to his show as Pat was the Ikeet's main singer, the other two being there mostly for decoration. Pat rented a small muse flat north of Marble Arch, and one evening I went over to visit her, armed with a Billy Preston LP I particularly liked. She was knocked out by it, and after a little dancing around we fell into her bed. She sure knew a lot more than I did about the joys of lovemaking. We did enjoy each other's company, but I think I was embarrassed to be seen out with her because of the comments of other musicians, which were probably meant in fun, but I didn't have a lot of confidence to deal with it. She even asked me to come with her on holiday to Spain, but as I had little money and wouldn't think of her paying, I didn't go. In fact, she was only a year or so older than me, but she already had two children back home and had done a whole lot more living than I did. I had never met Tina Turner until many years later at a garden party. She was sitting demurely there and I didn't want to go over and bother her. 
Then one of her minders approached and said, Tina would like to meet you, which is the right way to do it, I guess, like meeting the Queen. 